I have the pleasure and honor to um, report to you the work of a large team, Permasense, during the last six years. We've joined MIX in a second phase as a project. And what I will show you now is the effort of more than 25 people, and the most important of those you see listed here. Now, I work for physical geography at the University of Zurich, and what I will present to you will deal mostly with what you see in the background here already, that is mountains and how they react to climate change. I will try, however, to make this interesting also for the more technologically minded part of the audience. And for this, I will give you two complementary introductions. Now, first of all, what is permafrost? Because in Permasense, we do investigate permafrost. Permafrost is soil or rock that does not raise its temperatures above zero degrees for a year or more. That means it stays frozen for a long time. And that means it changes its properties for a very long time. It doesn't change its properties. It also means it is in the subsurface. You cannot see it as you walk or investigate the ground surface. And as you thaw this material, you will notice from um, playing in a sand pit probably as a child, saturated, water saturated sand is frozen, behaves more like concrete than like sand. And if you thaw this, its properties change. Now, if we do this outside in nature, if we thaw material that has been frozen for decades, for centuries or millennia, we can expect very strong changes, and we can also expect very much nonlinear and surprising changes because it takes place in a very narrow temperature range. And these examples here illustrate that to you. That is um, the Zymertz River landslide in northern British Columbia. You see the rupture area on the top right, and you see on the bottom right where it ruptured a natural gas pipeline by digging it out five meters deep. This illustrates to you, first of all, it's a topic of relevance beyond the Alps. And on the left, you see this little dotted line that goes through the mountain territory here. That's the pipeline. You see in blue the safety corridor around it. And you see in red this event that came from outside this safety corridor. Now, we want to understand the links between climate change, changes to permafrost, and changes to hazards that may affect human systems or livelihoods. And in doing so, we would like to anticipate changes. Now, I brought a little movie that was broadcast on Italian television for the second part of this introduction. And I want to exemplify to you why it is important to anticipate future environments and why it is not so smart to say, well, we can just focus on dealing with the changes as they arrive. Well, no one was killed in this incident, but several people did get hurt. Why am I showing this to you? I want to illustrate to you that what we can do with science and research is to create room for maneuver when adapting to unexpected change. I have included three images here taken from this movie on the left. And the first step, you could say, well, the people come there because mountain environments or environment in general is exciting. They have no perception of the hazard there. And um, because they lack the understanding, they don't even consider what they may have to be afraid of. And by the way, we would not help them by writing a paper on the damaged mechanics of ice. We could help there by investigating possible future threats or understand processes or to develop warning systems in a metaphorical state like this. But for the people going there, much like us being faced with global change, the past is not so much a good exclusive key to the future, at least not their past experience. Now, in the second part, you've heard in the audio part, when the first bit of ice detectors, people don't run away, they go, woohoo, which means, wow, it's exciting. The next big part of ice detectors, and still everyone looks at it and thinks, this is great. And then the entire face collapses, and almost no one realizes 
that the vertical motion of the ice will be translated into a displacement wave that will endanger them. By the time they realize, it's too late to leave because they simply have no more room for maneuver. Now we can contribute to this as scientists by attention to unexpected phenomena because these breaking off ice masses for them were unexpected. And we can try and consider interconnected systems such, systems, such as the ice falling and the displacement wave. But now let's turn to understanding processes and permafrost with mixed technology. I will show you two examples and on the left here you see a little colored bar that helps you to tell them from each other. And um, for each example I will try to point out how mixed technology helped to enable this research and I will also try to present you quickly how our geoscience research and the partnership has enabled our technology partners to arrive at new and interesting research questions and answers. And some of what I will show you now will repeat um, the demonstration that Andreas Hasler gave yesterday. What you see here are two photographs of ice exposed where rockfall detached in hot summers. On the right here, you see the Hernley Ridge on Matterhorn. And because we see massive ice at these detachments, this is a hint for us that permafrost frozen material plays a role in detaching these rock falls. Now we want to understand what is the role of the ice there. And if it plays a role in the detachment, can we detect differences in the movement already before the actual detachment that may help us to understand the processes that lead to the timing and location of those events. This is done with these high resolution crack meters that measure the distance between two rock masses over a cleft, some auxiliary measurements in clefts and in the rock that measure temperature, and that's transmitted with those wireless sensor nodes that usually when I give a talk I have to explain, but I probably don't have to do this here. We instrumented around the detachment of this rockfall that I've just shown you that exposed the ice because we were interested in measuring clefts that had ice at depth. And without having a rockfall offering a view into the mountains, it would be difficult to know if or if not we instrument a ridge that has ice. So all those circles here indicate places where we had instruments and the sensor network there has been operating since 2008 and now several others have completed the suite of these installations. And currently there are about 80 nodes running with about 500 sensor channels and there are several hundred million data points in the database that have been generated. Now when you look at the results, this is a very quick summary of something that has a lot more depth. But you see here in the top part four about three years, the temperatures measured inside the rock on a ridge. Now the red curve shows to you the warm part, the sunny, the south part of the ridge. The blue part shows the northern part of the ridge. And the gray curve in between shows to you a cleft in between. And it's relatively warm in summer, and it's relatively cool in winter. In the lower graph, you can see a plot of cleft extension, only in one direction, perpendicular to the cleft. They all start with a common datum here. And the summer periods with thaw here are marked in red. And what you can see is that some clefts, and this is well visible with the blue clefts, they get bigger in winter and they get smaller in summer. And this corresponds with what we would expect because rock expands thermally when it gets warmer, so the clefts in between get smaller in summer and the reverse effect during winter. But you see some periods, you see this in the red here very clearly, where in summer there is a very strong movement and that movement is not reversible. And that gave us an insight into the processes that operate here and it also provided a first avenue for further research of those processes and it may be an avenue to follow for early warning because we really believe that these are the signals that correspond with the slow preconditioning of a detachment. Now how has this been enabled by MIX? Very clearly if we had to install something like this 
with ordinary technology, we would have to put out a lot of wires. That is difficult and expensive, but it would mean that our installations get wiped out after a few weeks by lightning in those conditions. So having the spatial replication that we need to really detect the clefts that have this movement and to see that, yes, there is a pattern because several of them show this, this has only been able, we have only been able to reach this with this wireless technology at hand. Now, for the people in our team who made this technology, this also brought new challenges. Even with these systems that have a constant sampling rate and generate only about a tenth of a megabyte of data per day. One is data integrity, where there are packet duplicates, <coughs> there's packet loss, there's a wrong ordering of the packets, and also the transfer rate changes. And this led to the insertion of a model-based testing stage into the data processing chain. And this model was able to detect data loss, deal with clock drift, packet duplicates, and node restarts. And that means that for us, let's say the consumers of this data, we don't have to deal with the wireless sensor network specific errors that are in there because we would almost not be able to detect and remove them. A further line of research that has spawned from the discussions we had, especially with Carl Alvarez's group here in Lausanne, but we're not operationally using this at the moment, is an interactive but model-aided cleaning of large data sets where a model beforehand would tell you where you're likely to find erroneous data that you still want to inspect visually. Now, leaving this first topic of, let's say, constant data rate sensing and rock stability, and if we go to a new topic, again, the same image, the ice exposed at Matterhorn. This time we ask the question, how did the ice get in there in the first place? Because if we can understand how the ice gets there, maybe we can understand which locations will be prone to rockfall in the future. What you see here is a very nice and old graph um, from permafrost research in the high Arctic, in loose material and ordinary soil that is near horizontal. And you can't see the numbers, but this is depth in a drill hole. It goes down to about 10 meters. This is um, ground ice content by volume. And there is a zone very close to the surface that has a lot of ice. And just that's the upper layer of permafrost. And there is a very sneaky process almost that leads to a progressive ice enrichment because it draws water to the freezing front there. So there is essentially massive water moved to those areas, and these areas are ice enriched. Now there are laboratory experiments shown here from Julian Merton in the beginning of 2000, where this is a large chalk block that has been ruptured here in the middle. The black lines you see is a fill of massive ice in this block that has been ruptured by this process. Now we believe it's possible that the same process that acts here is also at least partially responsible for the ice enrichment that now causes the rockfall during warming. To understand if and where this process is active, we want to listen to the damage increase in the rock. This is the damage that you can see visually, but if we listen to the microcrack formation, we can detect those changes much earlier and also in compact rock. For this, we built a customized acoustic emission sensing system. You see here how it's installed. The, the brown signifies rock, and you see um, here the blue system has two acoustic emission sensors at differing depths inside the rock. So we can arrive at a zonation to, to tell at which depth approximately the signal has originated. And um, actually fixing a microphone inside a little borehole in the mountains is not quite that easy. And we developed a system for that. And this is accompanied by measurements of liquid water content and temperature in the same profile that extends to about a meter or a meter 20 depth. Now the system continuously listens to the acoustic emissions and if it detects a crossing of a threshold, we call this an event, it statistically characterizes this event and 
stores the raw data trace on an SD card and the event is then transmitted in the wireless sensor network. To give you an expression, an impression of how this looks like, these are the drilling installations to put the sensors there. This is the installed system. You've also seen this in the brief movie that Karl Abra has shown in the beginning. And down here you see that the conditions sometimes are a little bit less favorable. This is the roof of the Jungfeuer research station and we've instrumented one place on the spur here that's very dry and one that is in the gully here that receives a lot of water. And the resulting data series from this look like this. You have in the top again temperature evolution over time, 50 centimeters and 10 centimeters depth. You see the rock is frozen here and slowly thaws over the development of this year. You see down here a relative moisture index. Why is it only an index? It's difficult to make an absolute sensing of such low moisture contents in rock. And here you see the detected event rate. And you can see, first of all, by the event rate, it's a very rich data set that will allow a lot of analysis. And you can also see it's an intermittent process. And we hope that this will help us, with the help of models, to differentiate the processes that are responsible for this. It can be volume extension, expansion of water during freezing, it can be the segregation, the drawing of water to the freezing front, or it could also be simple thermal dilatation. The results also show here when you plot the energy rate versus temperature that um, there is a lot of activity below zero, very little activity above zero. This confirms our hypothesis but it also shows that alternative hypothesis that says there's a discrete window where cracking occurs between minus 3 and minus 8, this that not, does not seem to hold. And in the lower part here, you see a plot very similar to the Gutenberg-Richter scale of um, the um, probability density function of, um, of the energy of the events. And over six or so orders of magnitude, there is a clean power law scaling which to us indicates that there's elastic interaction with the redistribution of stresses that would have to be accounted for in modeling the damage processes. Now again, this has been enabled by the technology in MIX because under normal circumstances you would not be able to operate lab equipment for acoustic emissions under those conditions. And it also meant new challenges for the technology team. You see here the, um, the hardware that has been developed for this. There's also a very nice poster on the back side of this wall that shows this installation. And what they had to deal with there is a, a very intense sensor, that's this processing sensor, that then is coupled to a, let's say, low data rate, tiny node. And this sensing that continuously analyzes the acoustic signals also has to keep performing when there are very strong bursts of signals. And the parameterization of this, as far as I understood, has been quite a challenge. Now, I've stressed the collaboration here a lot, and before I slowly finish this, I would like to show you another result exemplified with this picture. In the beginning, I said there's a generic challenge of adapting to unexpected change. And I think for the end of this talk, this is a very generic outcome of our MIX project. It's the collaboration of many different people. You see here group leaders, master students, PhD students, you see electronic engineers, geodesy people, geographers, you see actually a particle physicist from CERN there coming with us. And those people have dinner together here after an extremely long day in the field. I could also show you how these people sit over entity, entity relationship diagrams for databases or how they quarrel about some sort of data problems, but people interact during their everyday research for good or for worse. And I think this is a very important competency that we all have acquired in this. And I also think that's a competency that has a very long half-life. This will not become worthless or outdated next year or probably in 10 years. Personally for me, looking back on MIX, this is one of the greatest outcomes. Now, 
to end with an outlook rather than with a conclusion. Um, this is an image that a Swiss press photographer has made. And um, you see here, um, colloquially speaking, a PhD student dangling from a rope. And um, what this shows is that we have a chance because we have research in two different areas here in a topic that is of very high public interest at the moment. It's visually attractive and it allows us to disseminate our research and to generate excitement and appreciation for the research we're doing. And what you see on the horizon here are the names of two projects that are currently ongoing and that build on a lot of the technology that has been elaborated in Permasense. And the other things here on the horizon are different funding agencies that continuation follow-on proposals have been submitted to or are being submitted to. Finally, from myself, but I'm sure also on behalf of the entire team, I would like to thank the Swiss National Science Foundation and everyone in MIX for the wonderful time. It's been intense and inspiring and a very wonderful journey. Thank you and um, I'm open for questions.